This is the voice of Eric Bentley speaking to you from the studios of Folkways Records in the spring of 1963. Between the 20th and 30th of October, 1947, the Committee on Un-American Activities of the House of Representatives held some, quote, hearings regarding the communist infiltration of the motion picture industry, unquote. The chairman of the committee was J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey, and among its members were several men who either were or would later be famous, such as Richard M. Nixon of California, Carl E. Munt of South Dakota, and John E. Rankin of Mississippi. Among the witnesses called during that 10-day period were Jack L. Warner, Louis B. Mayer, Ayn Rand, Adolphe Monjou, Robert Taylor, Robert Montgomery, Ronald Reagan, Gary Cooper, Walt Disney, John Howard Lawson, Dalton Trumbo, Albert Maltz, Alva Bessie, Samuel Ornitz, Herbert Bieberman, Emmett Lavery, Edward Dmitrick, Adrian Scott, Dor Sherry, Ring Lardner Jr., and Lester Cole. We have subpoenaed witnesses, Mr. Thomas said, representing both sides of the question, and the testimony duly turned out to be chiefly of two kinds. One group of witnesses spoke against communism and named persons in Hollywood whom they regarded as communists. The other pleaded the Fifth Amendment and maintained that the investigation was improper. The second group would later get jail sentences for contempt of Congress. But one or two witnesses stood outside both the groups. Dor Sherry is an example. Another is Emmett Lavery, who stated a social philosophy close to that of Pope John XXIII's encyclicals of the 1960s. The witness who stood furthest apart from the others was Bertolt Brecht, whose testimony you are now about to hear. The scene of this Brechtian tragic comedy is the crowded caucus room of the old house office building, Washington, D.C. The date is Thursday, October the 30th, 1947. Present are only three members of the committee, Parnell Thomas, John McDowell of Pennsylvania, and Richard B. Vale of Illinois. With them is Robert E. Stripling, chief investigator. Bertolt Brecht is accompanied by two attorneys, Bartley Crum, and Robert W. Kenny. Yeah. The voice first announcing Bert Brecht's name is that of Stripling. The voice asking Brecht to stand is that of Parnell Thomas. Most of the questions afterwards and throughout the session are put by Stripling. Bert Brecht. Mr. Brecht, will you stand, please, and raise your right hand. You tell me swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. Sit down, please. Mr. Brecht. Will you please state your full name and present address for the record, please? Speaking to the microphone. My name is Petrold Brecht. I'm living at uh, 34 West 73rd Street, New York. I'm born, born in Augsburg, Germany, February the 10th, 19... Uh, 1898. Uh, Mr. Brecht, uh, uh, the committee has a... What, what was that date again? Did you give the date again? Uh, 10th of February, 98. 1898. 1898. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the committee has here uh, uh, an, an interpreter, if you desire, the use Thank of an interpreter. You. Thank you. You desire an interpreter? Yes, uh, I, I think you, uh, yes, uh, when you could pay me when uh, uh, I need to. An interpreter named David Baumgart is seated beside Brecht. Uh, where are you employed, Mr. Baumgart? The Library of Congress. Congress. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, may I read a statement in English? Yes, but has the, has the chief investigator completed his identification of both the interpreter and the witness? No, sir, I have not. Now, Mr. Breck, will you state to the committee whether or not you are a citizen of the United States? I'm not a citizen of the United States. I have, uh, States. I have only my first papers. Uh, when did you acquire your first papers? In... Uh, when I came into the country. Uh, when did you arrive in the United States? 
May I? I arrived in Jul July uh, 21st at uh, San Pedro. July the 21st, 1941? That's right. At San Pedro, California? Yeah. Uh, you were born in Augsburg, Bavaria, Germany, on February the 10th, 1888, is that correct? Yeah. I'm reading from the immigration records. Yeah. Uh, 19. Beg your pardon? I think the witness said it tried to say 19. Yes, I wondered if, uh, whether or not the immigration records were correct in that, or is it 98 or 98? 98. 98. Were you issued a, a quota immigration visa by the American Vice Consul on May 3rd, 1941 at Helsinki, Finland? That's correct. You entered this country on that visa? Yeah. Where had you resided prior to going to Helsinki, Finland? Uh, may, I, may I read my statement? In that statement, I have... Uh, well, uh, first, Mr. Breck, we're trying about. to identify you. The identification yes. won't be very long. I had, uh, I had to leave Germany uh, 33 in February when Hitler took power. Then I went to Denmark, but when war seemed imminent, then 39, I had to leave uh, for Sweden, Stockholm. I remained there for one year. Then Hitler invaded Norway and Denmark, and I had to leave Sweden, and I went to Finland there to wait for my visa for the United States. Now, uh, Mr. Brack, what is your occupation? I am, I am a playwright and a poet. Playwright and poet? Yeah. Uh, where are you presently employed? I'm not employed. Uh, were you ever employed in the motion picture industry? Yeah, I, yeah. I sold, uh, a story to a Hollywood firm. <coughs> uh, Hangman also died, but I did not write the screenplay myself. I'm not a professional screenplay writer. I wrote another story for a Hollywood firm, but that uh, story was not produced. Credit for the screenplay of Hangman Also Die went to John Wexley. Uh, the Hangman Also Die, uh, who did you sell that to? What studio? That was to, uh, I think, uh, an independent firm, Pressburger, at the uh, United Artists. United Artists? Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with Hans Eisler or Johannes Eisler? Yeah. With this, it becomes clear that Bertolt Brecht's presence in Washington had less to do with American writers from Hollywood than with an even more celebrated case. In September 1947, the German communist Gerhard Eisler had been brought before this committee. J. Edgar Hoover had reported that he had been the representative of the Communist International to the Communist Party of the USA. Eisler's sister, Ruth Fisher, denounced him before the committee as a leading agent of the Russian secret police. I regard him as a most dangerous terrorist, she said. I consider Eisler the perfect terrorist type, conditioned to hand over to the GPU his child, his sister, his closest friend, unquote. There followed a lengthy questioning by the committee of the composer Hans Eisler, brother of Gerhardt and Ruth. The Hans Eisler material in the committee's printed records fills more than 200 pages. It also only narrowly missed creating the biggest national scandal since the Teapot Dome scandals for it was made to seem possible that Mrs. Roosevelt's name was involved in conspiracy. She had had something to do with getting Hans Eisler a visa, and Hans Eisler had a great deal to do with the international communist movement. The published transcript is illustrated with photographs showing Eisler leading Russian children in song, Eisler giving the clenched fist salute and whatnot. 
One name that was bound to come up was that of Bertolt Brecht, whose words Hans Eisler had often set to music. The committee had a complete translation made of the Brecht Eisler oratorio, The Measures Taken, and wrote it into the record. Gerhard Eisler was convicted of contempt of Congress and of passport violations. Hans Eisler, having been arrested, was out on bond awaiting a hearing on a deportation order. It was at this interesting point in time that Mr. Stripling put the question, how long have you known Johannes Eisler? How long have you known Johannes Eisler? I think since the uh, middle of the 20s, uh, 20, 20 years or so. Have you collaborated with him on a number of works? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Breck, are you a member of the Communist Party, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? May I read my statement? I'll answer this question. May I read, but may I read my statement? Uh, would you after? submit your All statement right. to the Let's chairman? Parnell Thomas looked over the statement and made the following comment. Mr. Breck, the committee is carefully going over the statement. It's a very interesting story of uh, German life, but it's not at all pertinent to this inquiry. Therefore, we... The statement Brecht was not allowed to read was as follows. I was born in Augsburg, Germany, the son of an industrialist, and studied natural science and philosophy at the universities of Munich and Berlin. At the age of 20, when participating in the war as a member of the medical corps, I wrote a ballad which the Hitler government used 15 years later as the reason for my expatriation. The poem, Legend of a Dead Soldier, attacked the war and those wanting to prolong it. I became a playwright. For a time, Germany seemed to be on the path of democracy. There was freedom of speech and artistic expression. In the second half of the 1920s, however, the old reactionary militarist forces began to regain strength. I was then at the height of my career as a playwright, my play, The Three Penny Opera, being produced all over Europe. But in Germany, voices could already be heard demanding that free artistic expression and free speech should be silenced. Humanist, socialist, even Christian ideas were called Undeutsch, un-German, a word which I hardly can think of without Hitler's wolfish intonation. At the same time, the cultural and political institutions of the people were attacked. The Weimar Republic, whatever its faults, had a powerful slogan accepted by the best writers, Die Kunst dem Volke, Art to the People. The German workers, their interest in art being great indeed, formed a highly important part of the general public. Their sufferings in a devastating depression, which threatened their cultural standards, the impudence and growing power of the old militarist feudal imperialist gang alarmed us all. I started writing poems, songs and plays reflecting the feelings of the people and attacking their enemies who now marched under the swastika of Hitler. Persecutions in the field of culture increased. Famous painters, publishers, and distinguished editors were persecuted. At the universities, political witch hunts were staged, and campaigns were waged against pictures such as All Quiet on the Western Front. These, of course, were only preparations for more drastic measures. When Hitler seized power, painters were forbidden to paint, publishing houses and film studios were taken over by the Nazi party. But even these strokes against the cultural life of the German people were only the beginning. They were designed as a spiritual preparation for total war, which is the total enemy of all culture. The war put on the finishing touch. The German people now have to live without roofs over their heads, without sufficient food, without soap, without the foundations of culture. In the beginning, only a few were capable of seeing the connection between reactionary restrictions in the field of culture and the ultimate assault upon the physical life of a people. The efforts of the democratic anti-militaristic forces of which those in the cultural field were, of course, only a small part, proved to be weak indeed. Hitler took over. I had to leave Germany in February 1933, the day following the Reichstag fire. A veritable exodus of writers and artists began, of a kind such as the world had never seen before. I settled in Denmark and dedicated my total literary production from that time on to the struggle against Nazism. Some poems were smuggled into the Third Reich, and Danish Nazism, supported by Hitler's embassy, began to demand my deportation. Of course, the Danish government refused, but in 1939, when war seemed imminent, I left with my family for Sweden, invited by Swedish senators and the mayor of Stockholm. I could stay only a year. Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway. We continued our flight northward to Finland, there to wait for an immigration visa to the USA. Hitler's troops followed, 
Finland was full of Nazi divisions when we left for the United States in 1941. We crossed the USSR by the Siberian Express, which carried German, Austrian, Czechoslovak refugees. Ten days after our leaving Vladivostok aboard a Swedish ship, Hitler invaded the USSR. During the voyage, the ship loaded copra in Manila. Some months later, Hitler's allies would invade that island. We applied for American citizenship, first papers, that is, on the day following Pearl Harbor. I suppose that some poems and plays of mine written during this period of the fight against Hitler have moved the un-American activities committed to subpoena me. My activities, even those against Hitler, have always been purely literary and of a strictly independent nature. As a guest of the United States, I refrain from political activities concerning this country, even in a literary form. By the way, I am not a screenwriter. Hollywood used only one story of mine for a picture showing the Nazi savagery in Prague. I am not aware of any influence which I could have exercised in the movie industry, whether political or artistic. Being called before the Un-American Activities Committee, however, I feel free for the first time to say a word or two about American matters. Looking back at my experiences as a playwright and a poet in the Europe of the last two decades, I wish to say that the great American people would lose much and risk much if they allowed anyone to restrict the free competition in ideas in cultural fields or to interfere with art which must be free in order to be art. We live in a dangerous world. Mankind is capable of becoming enormously wealthy but as a whole is still poverty stricken. Great wars have been suffered. We are told greater ones are imminent. One of them might well wipe out mankind. We may be the last generation of the species man. Ideas of how to make use of the new capabilities of production have not been much developed since the days when the horse had to do what man could not do. Now do you not think that in such a predicament every new idea should be examined carefully and freely? Art can present such ideas clearly and even ennoble them. The hearing continued as follows. Now, I'll, I'll repeat the original question. Have you been a member of the Communist Party of any country? Mr. Chairman, I have heard uh, my colleagues uh, uh, and they considered this question not as proper, but I am a guest in this country and do not want to enter in any legal arguments, so I will answer your question fully as well I can. I was not a member or am not a member of any Communist Party. You have never been a member of the Communist Party? That is correct. You, you were not a member of the Communist Party for Germany? No, I was not. Uh, Mr. Bragg, is it true that you have written a number of very revolutionary poems, plays, and other writings? I have uh, written a number of poems and songs and plays in the fight against Hitler. And, of course, they can be considered, therefore, as revolutionary, because I, of course, was for the overthrow of that government. But, Mr. Griffin, we're not interested in yeah. any works that he might have written uh, calling for the overthrow of Germany, yes, I'm or the government there. Uh, well, from an examination of the works which Mr. Breck has written, particularly in collaboration with Mr. Hans Eisler, uh, he seems to be a person of international importance to the communist revolutionary movement. Now, Mr. Breck, uh, is it true, or do you know whether or not you have written articles for which have been... There's going to be another fall here pretty soon, so will you boys just... Sit down quietly, please, while we're... Go ahead. 
Have you written articles uh, which have appeared in uh, publications in the Soviet zone of Germany I within the past few months? I have, no, I do not remember to have written such articles. I have not seen any of them printed. I have not written such articles just now. I write a very few articles, if any. I have here, Mr. Chairman, a, a document which I'll hand to the translator and ask him to, uh, to uh, identify it for the committee and to refer to an article which appears on page 72. Oh, may I speak to that, uh, to that uh, publication? Beg pardon? May I explain this? Uh, yes, we, we want to identify the publication. Oh, yes. That uh, is not an article. Mm. That is a scene out of a play I wrote in, I think, 1937 or 1938 in Denmark. The play is uh, called Private Life of the Master Race. And this scene is one of the scenes out of this play about a Jewish woman in Berlin in the year of 36 or 37. It uh, was, I see, printed in this magazine Ost und West. And in fact, the private life of the master race had been presented in New York in 45, complete with the Jewish wife scene. Uh, Mr. Translator, would you uh, tr translate the front piece of the magazine, please? East and West, Contributions to Cultural and Political Questions of the Time, edited by Alfred Kantorowicz. K-A-N-T-O-R-O-W-I-C-Z. Berlin, July 1947, first uh, year of publication and price. Kantorowicz was a communist or communist sympathizer at that time. In 1956, he was to break with the communists and flee from east to west Germany. Uh, Mr. Breck, do you know the gentleman who is the editor of the publication whose name was just read? Yes, I know him from Berlin, and I met him in New York again. You know him to be a member of the Communist Party of Germany? Uh, when I met him in Germany, I think uh, he was a journalist in the Ullstein Press. That is a, not, a, not a communist, uh, was not communist, there were no communist oil uh, papers, so I do not know exactly whether he was a member of the Communist Party of Germany. You don't know whether he was a member of the Communist Party or not? I don't know, no, if no, I don't know. Uh, in 1930, uh, did you, with Hans Eisler, write a play entitled D.I.E. capital M.A.S.S.N.A.H.M.E.? Uh, Die Maßnahme. Did you write such a play? Yes, yes. Now, uh, would you explain to the committee the theme of that play? What it dealt with? Yeah, yeah. I'll try to. Uh, first, yeah. explain what the title means. Uh... The Maßnahme means measures to be taken, steps to be taken. Would it, would, could it mean disciplinary measures? Not disciplinary measures, no. <coughs> it means in these uh, measures to be taken. Speak here the microphone. It uh, means only uh, measures or steps to be taken. All right. Uh, you tell the committee now, Mr. Yeah. Craig, what this play dealt with. Yeah. This play is the adaptation of an old religious Japanese play, so-called no play, and on 
and aunt follows quite closely this old story which shows the devotion for an idea until death. What was that idea, Mr. Brick? The idea in the old day was a religious idea, the, uh, this, uh, some uh, pupils, young people. Uh, didn't it have to do with the Communist Party? Yes, it's a new within the Communist Party. Yes, yes, a new, it's a new place, the adaptation. Had to do, uh, had as a background, Russia, China of the 18 years, 18 or 19 or so. Uh, there, uh, some communist uh, agitators, agitators uh, went to uh, the, uh, the Russia, which then was not a state and had no real... Uh, Mr. Brick, limit. may I interrupt you? Would yes. you consider the play to be pro-communist or anti-communist? Or did it take a neutral position regarding communism? No. I would say... You see, in... as uh, You see, literature has the right and the duty to give to the public the ideas of the time. Now in this play, of course I wrote about 20 plays, but in this play I tried to express the feelings and the ideas of the German workers who then fought against Hitler, I also formulated in a artistic, Fighting but in a positive Hitler. way. Fighting against Hitler, did you say? Yeah. Written in 1930. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That uh, fight uh, started in 23. Uh, you say it's about China, though. It has nothing to do with Germany? No, it had nothing Let to do with Let me read some of the excerpts Germany. from it. Yeah. Throughout the play, reference is made in a laudatory fashion to the teachings of Lenin, the, quote, ABC of communism, end quote, and the activities of Chinese Communist Party in general. The following are excerpts from the play. The four agitators, quote, we came from Moscow as agitators. We were to travel the city of Mukden to spread propaganda and to create in the factories the Chinese party. We were to report to party headquarters closest to the border and to requisition a guide. There in the ante room, a young comrade came toward us and spoke of the nature of our mission. We are repeating the conversation. The, the young comrade. I am the secretary of the party headquarters, which is the last towards the border. My heart is beating for the revolution. The witnessing of wrongdoing drove me into the lines of the fighters. Man must help man. I am for freedom. I believe in mankind, and I am for the rules of the Communist Party which fights for the classless society against exploitation and ignorance. The two of us have to defend the revolution here. Surely you have a letter to us from the Central Committee which tells us what to do. The three agitators. So it is, we bring you nothing, but across the border, the muckin we bring to the Chinese workers, the teachings of the classics and of the propagandists, the ABC of communism, to the ignorant the truth about their situation, to the oppressed, class conscious, and to the class conscious, the experience of revolution. From you, we shall requisition an automobile and a guide. The four agitators. We went as Chinese to Mukden, four men and a woman, to spread propaganda and to create the Chinese party throughout the teachings of the classics of the propagandists, the ABC of communism, to bring truth to the ignorant about their situation, the oppressed, class conscious, the class conscious, the experience of the revolution. The individual has two. The party has a thousand eyes. The party sees seven states. The party has many hours. The party cannot be destroyed, for it fights with the methods of the classics, which are drawn from the knowledge of reality 
and are destined to be changed in that the teaching spread through the masses. Who, however, is the party? It is sitting in a house with telephones and its thoughts secrets, its resolutions unknown. Who is it? It is all of us. We are the party. You and I, all of you, all of us. In your suite, it is comrade. In your head, it thinks. Where I, wherever I live, there it is home. And wherever you are attacked, there it fights. The translation is close enough to the German. It is Mr. Stripling's way of reading it that makes it hard to follow. He says, sweet for suit, class conscious for class consciousness. It is for is it, and so on. He also skips from page to page without saying so. Sometimes he doubles back without saying so. Let me refer anyone who wishes to read the measures taken properly to the full text as now published in my own collection, The Modern Theatre. The point here is that Stripling had quizzed Hans Eisler on the measures taken a month earlier, and that Hans Eisler said the play was about the murder of a communist by three other communists, and that the title could be translated, The Disciplinary Measure. Now, Mr. Breck, would you tell the committee whether or not one of the characters in this play was murdered by his comrades because it was in the best interest of the party? Is that true, of the Communist Party? Uh, no, it is not, uh, not quite. Uh, because so he violated so. discipline, he was no. murdered by his comrades. Isn't that true? No, that is not, uh, not really so in the play. You will find when you read it carefully that like in the old Japanese play where other ideas were at stake, the young man who died uh, was convinced that he had done damage to the mission he believed in and he, agree uh, he agreed to that and was ready to die in order not to make greater that damage. So he asks his comrades to help him and all of them together help him to die. He jumps into a abyss and they lead him uh, tenderly to that abyss and that's the story. Well, well, I gather from your remarks, from your answer, that he was just killed. He wasn't murdered. <laughs> he wanted to die. So they killed him? No, they did not kill him. Not in this story. They, he killed himself. They supported him. But, of course, they had told him it were better when he disappeared. <laughs> for him and his, for him and them, and the cause he also believed in up till the end. Brecht would seem to be speaking here not of the measures taken, but of Der Ja-Sager, He Who Says Yes, another play of his that is derived from the same no play as the measures taken. No one will ever know whether Brecht's memory was playing him tricks or whether he wanted to lead Mr. Thomas a dance. Uh, Mr. Brecht, uh, did you tell the committee how many times you've been to Moscow? Yeah. I was, in, was invited to Moscow uh, two times. Who invited you? Uh, uh, was it the first time I was invited uh, by by Vox, that is a, a cultural, it's an organization for cul cultural exchange. Or, I, don't know. Uh, I was invited to show a, a picture, a documentary picture I had helped to make in Berlin. What was the name of that picture? Uh, the name is... Uh, uh, it's the name of a suburb of Berlin, Kule Wampe. The picture was shown in the United States under the title Whither Germany. Ernst Busch was a leading actor in it, and it had a score by Hans Eisler. The Brecht Eisler Solidarity song, to be mentioned shortly by Stripling, was sung in the picture. Can you spell that, please? K 
U H L E W A M P E. Uh, while you were in Berlin, did you meet? I mean, uh, pardon me. While in Moscow, did you meet uh, Sergei T R E T Y A K O V? T R E T Y A K O V. Tretiakov. Uh, uh, Tretiakov. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that is a a Russian playwright. Yes. Writer. Yes. Sergei Tretiakov was indeed a Russian playwright and quite a famous one. He wrote *Roar China*, which the Theatre Guild produced in New York in 1930. It is ironical that the article cited by Stripling appeared in a Moscow magazine as late as 1937, since soon after that Stalin purged Tretiakov as a Trotskyite. Brecht, though he is speaking ten years later, probably did not know how and why Tretiakov died. He translated uh, some of my poems and I think one play. Uh, Mr. Chairman, International Literature, number five, 1937, uh, published by the State Literary Art and Publishing House in Moscow, had an article by Sergei Tretyakov, leading Soviet writer, an interview he had with Mr. Brett. On page 60, it states, quote, I was a member of the, this is, he's quoting Mr. Brett, I was a member of the Augsburg Revolutionary Committee, Brecht continued. Nearby in Munich, Levine raised the banner of Soviet power. Augsburg lived in a reflected glow of Munich. The hospital was the only militant unit in the town. It elected me to the Revolutionary Committee, end quote. Petrokov continues. He wrote Drum at Night. This work contained echoes of the revolution. The work of the scathing satire on those who had deserted the revolution. His play, Das Nominee, the first of Brecht's plays on the communist theme is arranged like a court where the characters try to justify themselves for having killed a comrade. When he visited Moscow in 1932, Brecht told me his plan to organize a theater in Berlin which would reenact the most interesting court trials in the history of mankind. For example, the trial of Karl Marx. The story of economics brought Brecht to Marx and Lenin, whose works became an indispensable part of his library. Breck studies and quotes Lenin. Lenin is a great thinker and is a great master of prose. According to Breck, the theater should act upon the spectator's intellect. The traditional drama portrays the struggle of class in instincts. Breck demands that the struggle of class instincts be replaced by the struggle of social consciousness, of social conviction. He maintains that the situation must not only be felt, but explained, crystallized into the idea which will overturn the world. Breck, the artist, has an extremely broad and varied range. He has composed many ballads, songs, and choruses on the subject of revolutionary ruthlessness. His bookshelf, however, contains books of science and action and Lenin. Do you recall that interview, Mr. Breck? No. must have been written 20 years ago or so. I don't know. I'll show you the magazine, Mr. Brent. Yeah. I do not doubt there was, as I said, in the view, of course. I do not recall, which Tibbing, I do not recall the interview in itself. I think it is a more or less uh, journalistic uh, uh, some fashion, uh, summary, make up. A summary of of uh, of talks or discussions about many things made by Tretyakov. Brecht was right, and Stripling omitted to say that this was all explained in the article itself. Stripling also did not bother to explain that he did not read straight on in the article, but made many omissions ad lib. Have many of your writings been based upon the uh, philosophy of Lenin, Marx? No, I don't think that is quite correct. And uh, but of course, uh, I studied. I had to study as a playwright. I think who wrote historic uh, plays. I of course had to study to study uh, uh, Marx's ideas about history. I do not think that uh, 
intelligent plays today, today can be written without uh, that study. Also, history now is uh, written now is widely influenced by this by the studies of Marx about history. Uh, Mr. Breck, since you have been in uh, the United States, have you attended any Communist Party meeting? No, I do not think so. You don't think so? No. Well, aren't you certain? No. I'm, 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 I'm certain, I think. You're yes. certain that you've never attended? Yeah. Quite, I think so. You have, yeah. yeah, you see, yeah, I'm here six years. I'm here six years. I do not think so. That, that do not think that I attended, that I attended uh, political uh, meetings. No, no, never mind political meetings, but have you attended any communist meetings in the United States? I do not think so. No, you're certain? I think I'm certain. You think you're certain? Yeah. I mean, you don't know what, uh, what, it, what it. No, I have not attended such meetings, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Mr. Brack, have you, uh, since you've been in the United States, have you met with any officials of the Soviet government? Yes. Yes. In, uh, in uh, Hollywood, I was invited sometimes, three or four times, there, uh, to the Soviet consulate, with, of course, with many other. Right, right. What others? What? What others? What others? With other writers and uh, artists and uh, and uh, actors, to uh, they gave uh, some uh, receptions uh, at the special Soviet fire fire uh, festivities. Yeah, festivities. Did any uh, officials of the Soviet government ever come and visit you? I don't think so. Uh, didn't Gregory Kaifitz visit you on April the 14th, 1943, vice consulate of the Soviet government? You know Gregory Kaifitz, don't you? Uh, watch out on this one. I don't uh, remember that name, but uh, I might have no, uh, known him, yes. Gregory Kaifitz was a Soviet vice consul in San Francisco. Hans Eisler seems to have been questioned about him by a subcommittee of the HUAC that went out to California in the spring of 47. Later on the same day as Bertolt Brecht appeared in Washington, a committee investigator, Louis J. Russell, would claim to have linked Gregory Kaifetz through intermediaries to J. Robert Oppenheimer. One could say with some reason that the whole Oppenheimer case dates from here. I don't Did he come and visit you on April the 14th? 1943. It is quite possible. And again on April the 27th. And again on June 16, 1944. That is quite possible, yes. That somebody, I do not know, uh, uh, I do not remember the name, but, uh, but that somebody of the, uh, of the, some of the cultural attaches or, or, uh, what, was was Cultural attaches. Yeah, Spell or, the name. Or vice consul. Visit us. G-R-E-G-O-R-I. Capital K H E I F E T S. Cap. I'll spell the last name again. K H E I F E T S. Kaifitz. Yes. Do you remember Mr. Kaifitz? I do not remember the name, but uh, but it is quite possible. Uh, but I remember dimly. Dim, I remember that uh, that uh, that from the. I think from the. Yes, from the consulate, from the Russian consulate, uh, some people visited me, not, but not only this man, only also, I think, consul once, but I do not remember his name either. What was the nature of his business? Uh, he, uh, uh, it must have been uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, my literary connections with... Uh, with uh, German writers, and uh, some of them are friends of mine. In, German writers? In, yeah, in Moscow. In Moscow? Yeah. And uh, they appeared in, in the Staatsverlag, in Soviet Union, translations of my plays, for instance, 
ze is uh, vrijverblijf of ze master is en Galileo en een novel The Penny for the Poor en poems en zo. So. Did uh, Gerhard Eisler, Gerhard Eisler, ever visit you? Not Hans, but Gerhard. Yeah, I met Gerhard Eisler too. He is the brother of Hans, and he visited me with Hans, and then three or four times with, uh, without Hans. Uh, could you tell us in what year he visited you? Wasn't it the same year that Mr. Kaifitz visited you? I don't, I do not know, but uh, there's no connection. I do you recall him visiting you on January the 17th, 1944? No, I do not recall his state. But he might have visited me, visited me in his state. Uh, why did he visit you? Now, uh, he used to ask for his brother, who as I told you, is an old friend of mine, and we played some games of chess, too, and we spoke about politics. About politics? Yeah. He's what was that last answer? I didn't get the last answer. They spoke about politics. In any of your conversations with Gerhard Eisler, uh, did you discuss the German communist movement yeah, we, yeah, we spoke about, uh, of course, about uh, German politics. He, he is a specialist in that. He is a politician. He is a politician. So he, yeah, he knew. He, of course, knew very much more than I knew about the situation in Germany. Uh, Mr. Brecht, Sorry. can you tell the committee uh, when you entered this country? Did you make a statement to the immigration service concerning your past affiliations? I do not remember to have made such a statement, but I made, I think, the usual statements that I did not in, uh, want to or intend to overthrow the American government. I might have been asked whether I belong to the Communist Party. I do not remember to have been asked, but then I would have answered what I told you, that I was not. That's what I remember. You stated, did, did they ask you whether or not you'd have been a member of the Communist Party? I do not remember. Did they ask you whether or not you'd ever been to the Soviet Union? I think they asked me yes, and I told them. Did they question you about your writings? No, not, not uh, as I remember, no. No, they did not. I do not remember any discussion about uh, literature in the consulate in Helsinki. Now, you stated that you sold the book, the story, Hangman Also Died to United Artists. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, to an independent firm in, yeah, in, yeah. Did Hans Eisler do the background music for Hangman also that? Yes, he did. Uh, do you recall who starred in that picture? <coughs> no, I do not. I you, you don't even remember who played the leading role in the picture? I... <coughs> I think Brian Don Levy played it. Do you remember any of the other actors or actresses who were in it? No, I do not. You see, it had not very much to do with the filmization itself. I, I saw the story and I gave then to the script writers some advice about the background of Nazis, in, of uh, the na Nazism in uh, Czechoslovakia. So had nothing to do with the actor. Mr. Tripling, can we hurry this along? We've got a heavy schedule. Yes, staff. now, uh, Mr. Bragg, since you have been in the United States, have you contributed articles to the, to any communist publications in the United States? I don't think so, no. Uh, are you familiar with the magazine New Masses? No. You never heard of it? Yes, of course. Did you ever contribute anything to it? No. Do they ever publish any of your works? That I do not know. They may, might have published some, uh, some translation of a poem, I think. But uh, I had no uh, direct connection. Uh, not in a sense of anything. I believe that Brecht's answer is truthful. 
search in the new masses files does not turn up anything by him it seems that he sent the new masses a letter in 1935 protesting against the theater union's production of his play the mother but that the new masses never printed the letter in praise of learning which mr stripling is about to mention is a song from the mother and it was often sung by itself as for example on an american phonograph record of the 30s issued under the label timely recording company sung by the new singers with mark blitzstein at the piano the line which will be debated reads in german du musst die führung übernehmen which means you must take over the leadership the translation which brecht is about to object to is actually rather close to the original did you collaborate with hans eisler in song uh, in praise of learning yeah I uh, collaborated. I wrote that song. He only wrote. You wrote, you wrote the song. I wrote the song. That would you uh, would you recite to the committee the words of that song? Yeah, I would. Uh, may I point out that that song is is uh, a is uh, comes from an adaptation I made of uh, Gorky's novel The Mother. And in in this song a Russian worker woman addresses what? other poor people. Uh, it was produced in this country, was it? Yes. Uh, Certi certified in New York. Yes. Now I'll read the words and ask you if this is true. Please. Uh, learn now the simple truth. You for whom the time has come at last. It is not too late. Learn now the ABC. It is not enough, but learn it still. Fear not. Be not downhearted. Begin. You must learn the lesson. You must be ready to take over. You no, must be... Uh, excuse me. That is the wrong translation. Uh, uh, that is not right. Just one second. I'll give you the correct text. That's not a correct translation? It's not correct, no. As well, to the meaning, it is not correct. As to the meaning, it is not very beautiful, but uh, I'm not speaking well, about that. What does it that. mean? No. Well, here is the, uh, I have here the uh, Songs of the People, uh, which was issued by the Communist Party of the United States, published by the Workers Library Publishers. Page 24, it says, In Praise of Learning, yeah. by Bert Breck, music by Hans Eisler. And it says here, uh, you must be ready to take over. Learn it, men on the dole. Learn it, men in the prisons. Learn it, women in the kitchen. Learn it, men of 65. You must be ready to take over. Yeah, and where, uh, goes right on through. That's, that's the translator. chorus of it. You must Mr. be ready to take yeah, over. Mr. Tripping, uh, maybe the translator. May the correct translation would be, you must take the lead. You must take the, the lead. The lead. It definitely says lead. It's the same word as the leader Hitler or something like that. It or is not take over. It, the translation is not a literary translation of uh, the German text I see here. Well, Mr. Breck, uh, as it has been published in these uh, publications of the Communist Party, then is that incorrect? What did you mean? I do not remember to have... Uh, I, do n I never got that book myself. I must not have been in the country when it was published. I think it was published as a song of... Uh, one of the songs Eisler had written the music to. I did not give any permission to, to publish it. I did not see, I think I never saw the translation. Well, do you have the, do you have the words there before? In German, you? yes. Of the song, as it appears. Oh, yes, in the book. Not as in it was day, originally in German day. Uh, It goes on. You must be ready to take over. You must be ready to take over. Don't hesitate to you ask questions, you comrade. Is that, is that in there? Don't hesitate to ask questions, comrade. Uh, why not, uh, why not let, the, uh, uh, why not let, let uh, him uh, translate from the German, word for word? Yeah, I think you are mainly interested in translation of this refrain, which comes uh, back and back, which is the end. I can't understand the interpreter any more than I can. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I said, Mr. Chairman, if you just that, please speak yeah. in that microphone. Maybe we can make out The last line of all three verses is uh, correctly to be translated, you must take over the lead, and not you must 
and take over. You must take the lead would be the best and correct, most accurate translation. Uh, Mr. Bragg, did you ever make application to join the Communist Party? Uh, I do not understand uh, the, question, uh, the question. Did I make... Have you ever made application to join the Communist Party of any no, country? No, 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 no. Never. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have... I was, independent, and I was an independent writer, and I wanted to be an independent writer, and I pointed that out, and also, uh, theoretically, I think uh, it was the best for me not to, not to join any party, whatever. And all these things you, you read here were not only see, uh, written for the German communists, but they were also written for the for workers of any other kind, social democratic work, workers were in this, uh, in this performances, so were Catholic workers from Catholic unions, so were workers which never had been in a party or didn't want to go into a party. Mr. Brecht, did uh, Gerhard Eisler ever ask you to join the Communist Party? No, no. Did Hans Eisler ever ask you to join the Communist Party? No, he did not. I think they considered me just as a writer who wanted to write the truth as he saw it, but not as a political figure. Do you recall anyone ever having asked you to join the Communist Party? Uh, some, some people might have uh, suggested it to me, but then I pointed out that it was not my business. Who were those people that asked you to join the Communist Party? Oh, readers or... Who? Readers of my... of my poems or... or people from the audiences. You mean uh, there was never an official approach uh, to me, to public... Well, some, some people did ask you to join the Communist Party, didn't they? Uh, in no. Germany. You mean in Germany? No, I mean but in the United States. No, 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 no. Now, you let, you let him. He's doing all right. He's doing much better than any other witnesses that you brought here. <laughs> you don't ever recall anyone in the United States ever asked you to join the Communist Party? No, I do not recall anybody ever asked Mr. McDowell, do you have any questions? No, I haven't. Mr. Dale. Mr. Stripling, do you have any more questions? I would like to ask uh, Mr. Breck whether or not he wrote a poem, a song rather, entitled Forward, We've not forgotten. Forward, we what? Forward, we've not forgotten. Uh, I do not uh, recognize the English title, maybe. Can I see... Would you translate it for him into German? The literal translation of the German would read, Forward and do not forget. It is a song well known to German left-wingers and generally called Solidaritätslied, Solidarity Song. The translation deviates from the German a good deal because the translator is hard up for rhymes and has to fit his words to Eisler's music. This translation, attributed to one Henry Jordan, was also put on a disc by Timely Recording Company in the 30s. Oh, now I yes, I know. You wrote yes. that. You're familiar with words to that. That is, yes, yeah, that is, yeah. Uh, would um, the committee like me to read that? Yes, yeah. without objections, order. Forward, we've not forgotten our strength in the fights we have won. No matter what may threaten, forward, not forgotten. How strong we are as one. Only these our hands now aching built the roads, the walls, the towers. All the world is of our making. What of it, what of it can we call ours? The refrain, forward, march on to power. Through the city, the land, the world. Forward, advance the hour. Just whose city is the city? Just whose world is the world? Forward, we've not forgotten. Our union in hunger and pain, no matter what may threaten, Forward, not forgotten. We have a world to gain. We shall free the world of shadow. Every shop and every room, every road and every meadow, all the world will be our own. Did you write that, Mr. Frank? No, uh, I wrote a German poem, but that is very different <laughs> from this thing. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much, Mr. Breck. And you're a good example to the witnesses of uh, Mr. Kenny and Mr. Crump.
We'll recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon. At that, Bertolt Brecht left the room, and within a few hours he had left the United States forever. I personally was not present at this historic encounter, but it had been broadcast, and a year or so later, in his living room at Feltmilen near Zurich, Brecht played me a recording of the broadcast which some friend had put on disc for him. I can still hear him laughing his dry laugh at the many comic turns in the dialogue. Some of Brecht's friends wished he had pleaded the Fifth Amendment, but he reiterated in private what he had said on the stand. As a visitor to America, he did not think he should claim the privileges of a citizen. He added that his chief legal advisor, Bartley Crum, advised him to state that he was a communist. Nothing can happen to you since you're not a citizen, and it was the German party you would have been a member of. But I wasn't a member, Brecht said he protested. It makes no difference, Crum is supposed to have argued. If you say you weren't a member, they'll forge a party card and get you for perjury. Brecht told me he was unwilling to take this line and preferred to risk telling the truth. Possibly the aspersion allegedly cast by Crum on the honesty of the committee will seem unfair. On the other hand, the committee's chairman did go to jail in 1949, and the charge, in essence, was dishonesty. He had accepted kickbacks from employees. Even before the final exposure of Parnell Thomas as a fraud, Brecht was embarrassed by the compliment he had received from him. You are a good example to the witnesses of Mr. Kenny and Mr. Crum. But he gave Thomas and his colleagues credit for one thing. They weren't as bad as the Nazis, he said. The Nazis would never have let me smoke. In Washington, they let me have a cigar, and I used it to manufacture pauses with between their questions and my answers. <laughs> 